Decades ago, I started growing food in my front and backyard, and I realized that my mission in life is to inspire and empower others to grow their own nutrient-dense, healthy, organic food. Because of this, a lot of people have come to me with their gardening questions over the years, and that got me thinking, what if we put together a community that would help budding gardeners blossom? So I finally made the idea a reality with my Urban Farm U member program. Each month, your membership includes three live online events, a monthly class, a chit chat with an expert, and a monthly coaching session, plus access to the experts on our member page and a significant discount on our signature courses. I'm deeply committed to transforming our global food system, and I do this by empowering you to grow your own food. The Urban Farm Membership Program is a simple way to get going. Please join me in transforming your food system today. To learn more, go to urbanfarmmembership.org or text MEMBERSHIP to 33444. That's urbanfarmmembership.org or text MEMBERSHIP to 33444. You're listening to the Urban Farm Podcast, your partner in the Grow Your Own Food revolution. Whether you've just been introduced to urban farming or you're a lifelong advocate, we're sure you'll leave feeling more informed, equipped, and empowered to dig deeper into the soil of your local food economy. With you every step of the way, here's your host, Greg Peterson. Today on the Urban Farm Podcast, we have author Michael Abelman to talk about his experience with Soul Food Street Farms. Michael, the co-founder and director of Soul Food Street Farms, is one of the early visionaries of the urban agriculture movement. He has created high-profile urban farms in Watts, California, Goleta, California, and Vancouver, British Columbia. Michael has also worked on and advised dozens of similar projects throughout North America and the Caribbean, and he is the founder of the Nonprofit Center for Urban Agriculture. His newest book is called Street Farm, Growing Food, Jobs, and Hope on the Urban Frontier, and is out now by Chelsea Green Publishing. Congratulations, that's a cool book. Michael lives and farms at the 120-acre Foxglove Farm on Salt Spring Island in British Columbia. Welcome to the show today, Michael. Hey, it's so nice to be with you. Thanks for having me. Oh my gosh, I'm excited to have you here. So I shared a bit about you. Can you fill in the blanks for us and share more about the path you took to get where you're at now? Yeah, I mean, uh, it's been quite a wonderful journey. I started farming actually uh, in the early 1980s. I farmed, joined an agrarian commune, believe it or not, that was based in Southern California. Wow. We had some 3,000 acres of farmland. We had uh, several natural food stores, a bakery, juice factory, huge wholesale organic distribution service at the Uh time, the largest in the country. Wow. I was 18 years old. I'm now 62. Uh, At 18, I was given the responsibility of managing the 100-acre pear and apple orchard that that community had that was located east east of Ojai, California. Right. And that was, was a remarkable experience for many, many reasons. It has essentially informed my whole career. I mean, it was, um, it was there that I discovered that while fertile soil and hot days and cold nights produced excellent fruit, Uh that it was more about the passion of the people you were working with and the energy Mm. that the people brought to the work they were doing that infused that fruit that we grew with, uh, with its good flavor. And we, we, um, we, you know, from there I went on to, of course, do a number of interesting projects, uh, 20, over 20 years on a project in Southern California uh-huh. called Fairview Gardens, where we founded in the early 1980s wow. an organization called the Center for Urban Agriculture. And I will tell you that it, in the early 1980s, when you used the words urban and agriculture in the same sentence, you were looked <laughs> at as rather strangely. And oh, now, yes. of course, there's a, uh, I'm fascinated uh, to see a an, whole international movement around this. Oh, yes. Uh, so that, non- that nonprofit started then, and that was we were proving some really interesting systems on that little 12-acre farm that was floating in a sea of tract homes and shopping centers uh-huh. in um, Southern California. We learned a lot on that project, but as I said, over 20 years there, and then eventually moved you know, 1,200 miles north to uh, an island off the coast of British Columbia. Our family farm is 120 acres wow. on that island. 
But uh, after a year or two of thinking I had wanted to retreat, <laughs> I was really wanting to get back into the trenches. Certainly when I was in California, we had started major projects in places like Watts in Los Angeles and mm -hmm. other urban agriculture projects I was involved with or consulting on. But it was in Vancouver that I got to really prove or to attempt to prove whether the concept of urban agriculture was really doable, whether we had the right to use the word agriculture, oh, which yeah. implies a very complex wow. set of skills. It implies production. It implies jobs. So we are working now on a scale that I think is, I don't know the veracity of this claim, but I'm told we are certainly one of the largest in North America. We're producing uh, 50,000 pounds of food on uh, about five acres of pavement using a very innovative system that we've designed. Wow. We're employing um, 30 people, most of whom are managing some form of long-term addiction and mental illness. We work in a neighborhood called the downtown east side where the term skid row was coined. Wow. And it's interesting, after you know almost eight years of doing this project, finally decided it was time to write about it, and the the book <laughs> is... A, an attempt to really not just say, here's how we succeeded, but more importantly, to talk about all the challenges and obstacles and and areas that we did not succeed, because I think that's, of course, more informative. Oh, yeah. So that's kind of been my journey. It's, it continues. No kidding. So I actually have a copy of your book. It's called Street Farm, Growing Food, Jobs, and Hope on the Urban Frontier. It looks, you know, I've skimmed it. It just arrived the other day. It looks like a fascinating book. Tell us a little bit more about it. Yeah, so, I mean, you know, I've been doing, uh, happens when these things come out, a fair amount of uh, radio uh, throughout the U.S. and Canada. Yep. And well, one of the questions that inevitably comes up is, why did you write the book? And, oh, of yeah. course, you know, my answer is pretty simple. I mean, number one, I wanted to, after... Um, not just eight years of doing this project, but now almost over 40 years of actually farming and and uh, starting uh, in the early days of the idea of urban agriculture to develop yeah. those systems. I wanted to put forward a really realistic look at what is possible. How many people can you feed on a very small piece of land? Uh, right. How many people can you employ? What is possible within our cities where most of the native soils are too contaminated to grow in. How, you know, what's the infrastructure look like? Yeah. What are the challenges in terms of the municipalities and municipal codes that don't address production agriculture? Um, mm. How do you work with disenfranchised people, as we do, people who are managing, uh, who are kind of living on the edges of, of um, society uh, to, to help allow agriculture to help their lives? And so the book it does a couple things. It, it, it shows, you know, what is possible. It demonstrates the challenges that, and obstacles we faced. And most importantly, it gives a voice to individuals who previously were voiceless. Yeah. It tells the story of our staff who have come through some really hard stuff and talks hmm. about their experience and how working with growing food and in a community of farmers has affected their lives. And I think it's uh, it's storytelling, which is my yeah. my style. It's so, your forte, yeah. yeah. So I think I think that hopefully uh, it will enlighten folks and and help kind of break through some of the the romanticism around uh, the idea of urban agriculture, which I think you know we really have to use those words carefully. Yeah, and you and and move the movement forward. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So I'm on page 203. This is chapter 10. I just flipped open the book. It's the Urban Food Manifesto. And I see a picture. Of, <laughs> I, I, I want to talk to you more about that. But I see a picture of Jesus here. Really yes. happy looking guy dressed in a green shirt. Can, can you tell us about him? Yeah, I mean, Jesus is, uh, that's a, that is one of my favorite photographs. Very positive and Yeah. You know, Jesus makes me smile. is a um, yeah, he's a um, more recent addition to our crew. When I say recent, uh, he's been with us, I think, for two or three years. Uh -huh. He um, he came to Vancouver from Guatemala. Uh, um, I think uh, he left during the Civil War. Mm -hmm. uh, Jesus says, like many of our staff, in fact, all of our staff uh, who are dealing with some form of long-term addiction, mm -hmm. is um, his choice, of course, has been alcohol and mm -hmm. But he is an incredibly warm and engaging individual. He is an exceptional farmer. And he, well, one wonderful thing is that Jesus gives me the opportunity to 
keep my Spanish tune. Oh too, yes, I'll bet. Which has been been uh, less active since I left California. But yeah. but no, he he's a really um, an amazing member of the crew who uh, I think brings a cultural element to our crew. Oh, yes. That there there are not many Latin members of our crew. We have a lot of First Nations individuals on the crew. Right. Uh, the downtown east side of Vancouver is the largest First Nations urban reserve there is uh, anywhere in the world probably wow. um, and so he's um he's certainly a gift and again throughout the book there are stories like Jesus which both present the hardship these folks have been through and also like in his case and certainly exhibited in that photograph the the joy that they find in what is essentially their only meaningful engagement for many people it's the only thing they have to do that is positive. really meaningful and, yeah. yeah so and positive you know so wow cool can you say more about this chapter urban food manifesto yeah you know it's it's interesting i think for most people who have been farming as a profession for long enough they will admit that you know there's a lot of time doing repetitive tasks oh, uh, yeah. in the field <laughs> where it's quiet but a yeah. lot of time for the mind to wander Right for you know dreams to develop, ideas yeah. to conceptualize, philosophies to be conceived of, and so this urban farming man, or it's actually I think I'm calling it in the book an urban food manifesto, is really the culmination of about 12, 15 years of thinking about some of the bigger issues around the food system and mm-hmm. how urban dwellers and individuals can participate, but also even down to um, some more fundamental uh, physical challenges in the in the food system. It's a series of ideas. It starts with a series of questions, and then goes into it's I think a 15 point manifesto. Yeah, you know, it's one of those things I've been developing. I've presented in in lectures that I give, but has been refined and developed, and finally for the first time uh, published at the end of this book. And it's it's good. It's great to inspire people to think about how their food comes to them. It's great to inspire new farmers to teach the techniques of farming. But at a certain point you really want to get down to okay, you know, what are the what are the real core issues that we're all facing? Yeah. And what kinds of responses can we take that are that can creatively address those issues in the food system? And that was kind of my little attempt to do so, mm-hmm. you know. So it, it addresses all kinds of crazy. I mean, there's, some of the ideas are really out there Good. on the edge, and that'll, others are more fundamental and more obvious. Yeah, that'll have us think out on the edge, which is really important. Yeah, yeah. What are some of the issues, food issues that we're dealing with in urban areas? Well, I think there's a number of them, and I think that uh, that's, that's a, one of the things I'm most proud of in the book is that um, – I do spend a fair amount of time addressing the obstacles, and I'll just go through some of them. Mm -hmm. Um, Obviously, access to land is a huge thing, especially Mm -hmm. in coastal cities. But even even now, as well in throughout most cities anywhere in the world, the value of land is so high that most landowners, developers, or -hmm. or municipalities that own that land are hesitant to tie that land up in uh, agriculture because they do not want to deal with the political ramifications of having to ask that agriculture to move when they are going to develop the land. Exactly. So we've addressed that by developing a movable, very innovative movable, movable system, which I can talk about. Uh, other obstacles are certainly theft and vandalism. We have found that's an extreme challenge. In our case, the population in the neighborhood we work in are, as I mentioned, all dealing with some form of long-term addic- addiction and as such, when someone needs uh, a fix or is dope sick, um, they will do whatever they have to 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 take care of that. We do not yeah. take it personally. It is our responsibility to secure things. But the truth is that whatever is not bolted down or secured disappears. And we have had thousands of dollars of mm. you know entire cooling systems yeah. from vehicles in a single night. The live electrical wiring in our we have uh, 16,000 square feet of tunnel houses, unheated tunnel houses. The wiring that powers the fans, um, anything, tools and computers yeah. and you name it, you know. So that's a big issue. Contaminated soil yeah, is absolute time. and fundamental. It is impossible and irresponsible for anyone to think that they can plant food crops in most, and I'm going to say that with some uh, certainty, most 
urban soils anywhere in the world Mm -hmm. without jeopardizing the health of the people that they are feeding. And so, you know, we have, again, developed a strategy to isolate the growing medium from either contaminated soils or from pavement, which allows us to either grow in parking lots or in areas, for example, a couple of our sites in Vancouver are on highly contaminated sites. Right. But because of the box system we're using, we have uh, been able to grow on them. So that's a big issue. Mm-hmm. Lack of space, even when there are leases available, uh, learning how to grow on very small spaces and to maximize production. What crops are appropriate in a small space like that? How do you grow them to maximize production and return? You know, mm-hmm. One of the biggest things that I find is an obstacle to really being able to use the word agriculture in urban in the words urban agriculture is uh, often in the cities um, there is not the skill level. Farmers who have farming skills are normally not hanging out in <laughs> towns. In urban cities, areas, you know? yeah. Yeah. I mean, what's unusual about what we did in Vancouver was simply that I took a farmer's instincts uh, from from 40 years of production experience and applied them to an urban uh, context. And... Um, so if you look at the photographs in the book or read the story, you'll see that this is kind of high-level, very sophisticated crop rotations and successions and, and planning systems that require somebody to really have either studied this or have had the experience to know how to do it. So that's yeah. that's often often a, uh, a, a weak element in a lot of urban systems. Yeah. So, I, I noticed when I was at – so I was at Fairview Gardens in 2003 and 2004 – uh, mm-hmm. for the uh, Bioneers Urban Ag Workshop that you guys did there. And one of the things that I recall back from back then was how systematized you had everything back then. So you were thinking this way back then. Yeah, I was, but it's funny. You know, uh, I think most people would admit to this uh, who have been working in a particular field for a long time and mm-hmm. who've reached a certain point in their career that, when I, it, uh, uh, you know, it's like asking uh, Joni Mitchell or Bob Dylan to play something that they wrote uh, 30 years ago. They probably cringe, you know. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah. I, I, when I think about where I was as a, as a farmer in 2003 or 4, I think, right. wow, I'm, I, I, at this stage in my life, even though that wasn't that long ago, I, uh, because you grow so much uh, in your skill set and your understanding mm-hmm. with each year. I go, ooh, where was I at? And I, I yes, it's true. Uh, we were, you know, we were really, I would say we were organized because yeah. of the scale that we were operating. At, at that time, 12 and a half acres was considered minuscule. Right. But that farm pr- was employing, gosh, over 25 people. Mm-hmm. I remember that. And producing a staggering amount of food for the local community. Mm-hmm. And to do that required that we needed to be fairly organized and do a lot of planning. Uh, although I'm not always the most organized person, I think the scale that I was operating on required me to, to be so. Yeah. I think I've certainly learned a lot more in the last, well, it's been now, that would have, that would have been, um, what, how many years ago? I've lost, <laughs> I've lost the thread, but a long time ago. 13 years ago was 2003, yeah. yeah. So I think probably if you looked at what we're doing now, there's a whole new level of instinct and yeah. technique that's been applied to it. And, and that's what's so exciting about oh, yeah. the work of farming is that as a biological system, number one, it's always changing. Mm-hmm. And so you, you have to maintain an open mind and a beginner's mind when you approach your fields and crops. And you're always learning new things and always adapting and changing. Yeah. So it never gets boring, ever. You know? That's the cool it's part. exciting. Yeah, that's definitely yeah. the cool part. That's definitely the cool part. I want to I touch on Fairview Gardens a little bit because I know that is a very fascinating story about how it came to be. Can you tell us that? Yeah, that, again, that seems like a long time ago. Uh, you know, I was involved with that project for more than 20 years. Yeah. And, and, of course, while there, that land was zoned for 52 condominiums. And right. so we had... We did a lot of work from the beginning to establish community education around food and agriculture. Mm-hmm. We had thousands of visitors every year. And part of that strategy was not just the essential need to educate a public that had become so disconnected from food and how it came to them and from natural cycles, 
But it was also uh, the other part of that strategy was simply that I knew that that land was in a fragile and precarious state. It mm-hmm. was it was a zone for development, and that I, what I wanted to do was to to get the public to identify with that land as if it was their own. And to do that, I oh, opened the doors up, and we had right. we had all kinds of programs, workshops, festivals, you name it. We had school groups coming by the busload weekly. And so when the time came, which it did, we were given one year to raise a million bucks, which in the 1980s was a lot of dough, trust yeah. me. We had already developed the relationships in the community. And in eight months, we raised that million dollars and uh, were able to successfully uh, preserve that land under yeah. what was one of the first active agricultural conservation easements in the country, one that not only required that land continue in agriculture, but specified what kind of agriculture, and wow. also specified that education was a big must be uh, yeah. taking place on that land. No, those are things that now give that land a voice and protect it in perpetuity. So that was exciting. Yeah. So when I, when I do this show, I'm always looking for those epic moments, and that's the story I remember from 2003, and that is... I think from an urban agricultural perspective in this country, this is one of the pivotal moments when you guys did that. Be- yeah. Be- yeah. I think it changed a lot moving forward. I have to say it was uh, it was an incredible time. It was one of the, the high points, certainly, of my life and career mm-hmm. because, uh, well, number one, many people said this was not possible. Yeah. They said that you could not. Mm-hmm. Uh, have a viable farm on 12 and a half acres. They said that you couldn't grow this or that or the other thing. Mm-hmm. And in the end, they said that it would be impossible to raise that kind of money to save that <laughs> land. And, and you know, kind of the story of my life is that, you know, you, um, you know, when those kinds of obstacles are put in your, in front of you, mm-hmm. you know, you have a choice. You can um, uh, make a U-turn and go the other way, go around them, or deal with them head on and try to provide some sort of model, you know, and, yeah. and it, my personality was such that, especially at that stage in my life, that I really felt, okay, you know, this is possible, we can do this, we can push the edges, mm-hmm. and look, I don't, you know, uh, there, <laughs> we had a lot of successes, and we also, uh, there were a lot of things that, that took place there that we were not so successful with, that we, you know, um, and those in many ways were as important as the fact that we saved Absolutely. the land. Yeah. At this point in my life, I'm uh, just as excited to discuss those areas that we may have fallen short because I think for people coming up in this, it's more informative. Yeah, we'll get there. I have a question okay, for you good. about that here in a little while. So <laughs> okay. there's, there's a couple more things that you've kind of mentioned so far that I want to touch on. You, sure. you, you said, do we have the right to use the word agriculture? in the Mm -hmm. context of urban. What do you mean by that? Well, look, um, you know, I'll address that head on. I mean, Uh I think that, I'll I'll be honest, a lot of farmers who've been working professionally and developing their skills uh, for many years take umbrage, take some offense to the use of agriculture Mm -hmm. uh, to apply to something that may be garden in scale or not require the kind of sophistication Mm -hmm. that they have developed, you Mm -hmm. know. And so, um, yeah, I mean, we're talking about language, but, you know, you wouldn't, for example, call yourself an actor because you just you once acted in the school play in elementary school or a, mechanic be- or a mechanic because you changed your oil. Mm-hmm. And so I think that it's uh, I th- what I'm addressing here is that agriculture is a very complex, sophisticated set of skills to mm-hmm. do well, that uh, just because if you put the right clothing on or have the right tools or read the right book does not necessarily make you a farmer. It takes a lot of years of apprenticing and studying and practicing and mistakes Uh to develop the kind of skill set required to do on that scale. Now, I think that we have to be very careful because in my view, in the the end, Mm -hmm. what will be most meaningful uh, and most powerful and where I think the, one of the great solutions to the food system is is in smaller scale garden scale projects. Yeah. You know, I think that's uh, individuals and families really need to take responsibility for their own food mm-hmm. and not depend on the one and a half percent of the population we call farmers. Right. And when that happens, 
and your front and backyards are used in your balcony and your window box and your community gardens. And the production of food is dispersed over a broader population. We will have created much more security in food and how it's coming to us. And so in the end, while I am careful about the use of the word agriculture in the term urban agriculture, because mm-hmm. much of it is garden scale, yep. and and there are farmers that you know have trouble with that, <laughs> In the end, it's the garden scale projects that I think are going to be extremely important to the future of the food system. You know, And so I think we have a lot to learn from each other. And, and the last thing I'll say about this is that you know, I don't have any illusions that urban agriculture is going to feed uh, our cities. I think that a much more intelligent conversation would be, what is the appropriate integration and relationship between urban agriculture, peri-urban agriculture, and rural production agriculture? Mm -hmm. What is appropriate to grow where and in what quantities? How do these systems integrate and support each other? Mm -hmm. Uh, And to address this, not urban agriculture, not in an isolated way, but as a part of a broader food system. And I think that's a healthier uh, conversation, which brings everybody into the into the. uh, importance in terms of how how this plays out. Yeah, I I do a push here in Phoenix. I call it my ten thousand urban farms project, and in order to qualify as an urban farmer, people need to grow food, share it, and then name their farm. And I, oh, I love it. I do that from a very grassroots perspective, and really mm-hmm. what you know. I, I was having a conversation with uh, one of my mentors recently, and he said, well, how many urban farms do you have in Phoenix? And I said, well, named urban farms, you know, probably three or 4,000. And he said, wow. He was thinking production agriculture sites. I was talking front and backyard sites. Right. Well, well, I think that's, that's awesome. I mean, I think the um, – what I love it to see is when those sites begin to – uh, work together and amongst each other to consolidate uh-huh. production yep. and to actually then when you start looking at it from that perspective on on the individual scale it's tiny it's like a garden but right. on the consolidated scale yeah wow i mean if you for example if you looked at the combined production it would be awesome to know what those numbers were i right. bet they're staggering oh yeah yeah exactly yeah. and then you know and, and one thing i've noticed found seen over and over and over again in nature is that there's so much abundance mm. in yes. when we start growing food. Yes. The abundance yeah. is just staggering sometimes. Well, that's really our job, you know. Yeah. And that's that's an amazing part of our job is that our job is to encourage, enhance and create abundance and that is a wonderful that's fun when you think of your job as a farmer as, as in that those terms yeah it's really amazing you know <laughs> yeah and to share i should follow and to share that abundance to figure out ways to distribute and share that yeah, abundance you exactly know? exactly yeah. so let's talk you mentioned a couple of times about your box system or movable farm tell me about that yeah so you know i was listing the numerous <laughs> challenges for doing what we're doing on the scale we're doing in any city. Uh-huh. Uh, I, I didn't mention municipal codes, which were never written to address <laughs> this kind of scale farming. Right, exactly. And I probably could go on. But in terms of the, the box system, I mean, the box system that we developed really addresses something that my friend Wendell Berry uh, refers to as solving for pattern. Oh, and solving yes. for pattern, you know, often when we solve a problem in our society, it's unfortunate, but we either create more problems or we do not address all the relationships that that problem or that issue has to all kinds of other things. Mm-hmm. And so the I would say the the box system that we designed is a pretty good example of using one elegant design solution to address a number of challenges that urban farmers will face everywhere, one of which is, as I mentioned, contaminated soil. Number two is pavement. Mm -hmm. Um, Number three, and probably I don't think these are necessarily in order because there is the uh, access to land and the extreme value of land uh, so that long-term tenure Uh and leases are nearly impossible. So these boxes address all of those issues, and they do it by they're designed with forklift tabs, so they're movable mm-hmm. on short notice. They're stackable and nestable. 
they have interconnected drains, so drainage from the boxes can be recycled and or directed wow. so that you don't have issues. They are uh, they have little tabs uh, in the tops to hold um, little holes to hold hoops so that you can have hoop coverings on oh, them. Oh yeah. And we spent we made a lot of expensive mistakes. Uh -huh. I'm talking about a lot of expensive mistakes, which I go into in the book, in order to come up with this design. So we now have a design which we have manufactured using plastic. Mm -hmm. They are virtually indestructible. They are black, so they, they do attract heat, and uh, which can be both, uh, for the most part, in our climate is wonderful. In other climates, you yeah, may want wouldn't be so good in Phoenix. <laughs> yeah, you would want more reflectivity, and we have certainly uh, got plans for other designs, especially on a parking lot. So, yeah, this is the set. We have uh, almost 10,000 of these boxes. So 10,000 wow. boxes... Four plus acres. We produce 25 tons of food. Uh, we employ close to 30 people. Mm -hmm. For every dollar we pay our staff, it has been studied and uh, by Queen's University, a two dollar and twenty seven twenty cent savings to the healthcare system, the legal nice. system, the social system. Nice. system. So there's a lot of wonderful social issues, as well uh, that are interesting handled. things yeah. associated with this. Yeah. And and just so people know, on page. At 54, 55, and 56, it looks like you have pictures of the box systems in your book. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. We, in fact, have not only did I include pictures of the current system, but I included pictures of the ones that failed. So that took a little courage. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know. So you'll. You can see in in full color <laughs> yeah. photographs of, uh, of our failures. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So the name of the book is soul food street farms yeah the book is called street farm actually uh, yeah. uh street farm growing food jobs and hope on the urban frontier mm. the name of the organization is soul food street Farms. Got it. Yeah. perfect so yeah. soul food spelled s-o-l-e how did That's that correct come, how did that come about well when we started the project uh, on the downtown east side mm -hmm. it was started under the umbrella of an existing uh, charitable organization mm -hmm called United We Can, which employed several hundred people from the neighborhood to clean up the streets and alleys and recycle bottles and cans. Oh, nice. And amazing, quite an amazing, the largest recycling depot in uh, in the region. Wow. And a wonderful source of employment for folks who were had barriers to employment, the same, same population we employ. Mm -hmm. And so we started under their umbrella. Uh, and they had a project called Soul, which is uh, short for Save Our Living Environment. <laughs> oh wow! <laughs> and we, so we called our project Soul Food Street Farms. Mm -hmm. And uh, eventually, after a couple of years, we expanded uh, beyond the capacity of our mother organization and formed our own yeah. charitable organization. And we continue to call uh, the the project uh, Soul Food. So yeah. Yeah. Cool. Cool. So a quote from the book. This was fascinating. I, I and I want you to speak to it. Uh, we build something like church and offer opportunities for the community, but we cannot save people. I know from experience that salvation can come from the soil. How does the soil yeah. offer salvation? Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's interesting. You know, first of all, I should say that just as to provide some context here, uh -huh. that if you were to walk down the street or drive down the street in the middle of the neighborhood that we work in, the downtown east side, mm -hmm. you would see some rather remarkable things. It's a neighborhood unlike any other. It's uh, There would be people, you know, in broad daylight with needles in their arms or someone pirouetting in the middle of the road, mm -hmm. high on crack. And, you know, all of us uh, have our judgments and our prejudices. You can't help it. I certainly have had them. But I, I since have discovered that those same people are uh, creative people, they're intelligent, mm -hmm. and they have the, the desire to do something meaningful in the world if given the opportunity. You know? yeah. And so all we did with this project was to provide that opportunity, and we did it through uh, urban agriculture, through food production. And so a number of things have happened. For one, we've discovered that when someone, when there are plants uh, dependent on someone for their survival. Oh, yes. uh -huh. When there's a community of farmers that are uh, expecting individuals to be there and harvesting and part of the team, when there's a neighborhood expecting their food or restaurants that are expecting their deliveries, mm -hmm. 
when people have a, a simple reason to get out of bed each day that amazing things can happen and, you know, really profound changes can happen, and they have, you know. Yeah. But one of the other things that we've discovered is, you know, many of us who have been farming for any length of time have instinctively and anecdotally known that at the end of the day playing in the dirt you just feel better <laughs> we don't really know yeah. we don't really understand that we never understood the science behind this but right. now there's been a number of very well documented studies that demonstrate that working with living soil mm-hmm. has a profound effect on mental health it yeah. uh, affects serotonin levels and other things and so we've also seen that we hear it from people they come to work feeling terrible i hear this repeated over and over mm-hmm. again Mm-hmm. And they leave feeling so much better, and and um, and this is repeated over and over yeah. again. And so, what's going on there? You know, something's going. On. And then, then there's this whole other piece, and that is just simp- the simple act of providing really nutritious, mm. really good tasting food to a community and participating in the farmers markets. We have a policy that every farmers market, and we do a number of them every week. Mm-hmm. Um, must have a member of our crew from the downtown east side front and center at the markets. We don't hide them away, and that forces that person to become socially engaged when even they're uncomfortable with it, and it forces the community Perfect. to engage with someone who normally they would not, when they looked at, they would right. not know, they would not see as a farmer, and they would not normally engage with. You right. know? So, so it's been pretty amazing, and yes, I think that, I think all of us who do this work would have to say that there's a mental health component to uh, to the work that we do with living soil and yeah. with growing food. Yeah. yeah. I sit in front of my computer six to eight hours a day, and, my, and I work at the house here at the Urban Farm, so my respite is to go out in the yard. Yeah, of things. course. So I, yeah, I completely yeah. love that. So where do you see your soul food movement in five years? Well, we are. That's a very good question because we're doing. We're now eight years into this, mm-hmm. and uh, it has not not been an easy eight years, but certainly an educational eight years, a very rewarding eight years. Mm-hmm. But we are now looking ahead. There's two things that are happening. The book, um, the Street Farm book, is being used in the region to um, uh, as a tool to raise. We're trying to raise a ten million dollar endowment to secure the oh. project we generate. The farms generate about $350,000 a year in uh, production, in wow. foods grown and sold. Uh-huh. But the budget for the project is annually is closer to 650000 wow. a year, and that other three hundred um, goes somewhere. to support the support the social component of what we yeah. do because we're doing we're doing financial literacy training, we're doing mm-hmm. you know trying to do all kinds of additional programs to work with the folks that we're working with. And if you were going to just run an urban farm, you'd hire people who were just, you know, skilled people who did that work. So, so, uh, so we're we're in the midst of uh, trying to secure the project um, financially for the future. We're also working with the city to have one permanent location in the city oh, of Vancouver. Hopefully, nice. where they're going to tear down these uh, bridges near one of our sites to put in a big park. Mm-hmm. We are proposing an, um, an agricultural, permanent agricultural component in that park with uh, interpretive signage and classrooms and canning facilities and the whole works. Nice. So we're remaining hopeful, and I talk about that in the book. We, we are hopeful that will be a possibility. Our staff is, you know, some of whom are homeless, some of whom have no roots or consistency in their lives, they depend on us to be rooted and grounded and mm-hmm. stable. So we feel like one permanent site would really help with that. Yeah. We are hoping uh, the original vision, uh, while we now employ 25, 30 people, the original vision was to keep expanding to new locations and by doing that, uh, being able to hire more and more people. Yeah. So our hope is still to... Um, to employ more and more people as the years go on, mm-hmm. but that requires more land, yeah. more skills, more management, you know. So, But I think in the end, uh, you know, we also have been asked, we get visits from cities all over the world mm-hmm. uh, who want to replicate this. There is a nuts and bolts of the, the book Street Farm, Growing Food, Jobs, and Hope on the Urban Frontier is the inspirational part of this. So there is some... Uh, nuts and bolts in it, but we also have produced a um, 
a toolkit, we've called it, oh, nice. which is very specific with all the details from everything from how to deal with the municipal codes and to uh, financial aspects to permitting to the nuts and bolts of the actual growing system, uh -huh. soil fertility at all. So it's all in that, and that will be out, we hope, in another six months or so oh, and, cool. uh, as a companion to this this to particular book. book. Oh, yeah. cool. Will Chelsea Green also be publishing that? Uh, I don't. I think we are, that is one we're going to do okay, as a self-published thing. We have a, a foundation in the region who has supported that. Mm -hmm. uh, I may talk to Chelsea Green about distribution. I haven't done that yet, so this is the first time I've actually announced that publicly. Oh. But, um, you know, the the current book does have a fair amount of, there's an appendix with some real kind of nuts and boltsy type things yeah. present in it. So, yeah. Fantastic. Yeah, it's a great book. I've been scanning it this morning since it arrived and so. an audio version which uh, i'm told is coming out soon oh nice uh, yeah, yeah audio version and a kindle version which okay. is already out i believe yeah, so, yeah. perfect i don't do i mean i have to hold a book in my hands you yeah know? i don't do the kindle thing yeah and the audio is done by uh you know they there are actors that that uh do yeah. that so it's done uh yeah yeah, yeah. perfect perfect well i want to shift on you and Please. I, I would like for you to talk about a time you failed, how you overcame that failure, and what you might have learned from it. Yeah, wow, that's a, uh, a really good question. I mean, um, <laughs> I've always said that, you know, agriculture is the culmination of 7,000 years of trial and error. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. and if, that, if that ever changes, then we are, we are losing. You know, we, we have to be willing to yeah. um, take risks, take chances, and and uh, fail. Out. Yeah. And so for me, it's interesting because um, after what forty some years doing this, I there are so many areas I can think of that that I tried and failed. Uh, mm -hmm. But you know, fa maybe failure is not the best word. Even, no. You know. Um, but I would say that you know uh, one of the challenges of working in agriculture is the almost all-consuming requirement of being 100 percent present with the plants and the work on a day-to-day -day mm. basis trying to meet meet harvest deadlines and delivery deadlines and meet yeah. your planting schedule and so i think what happens sometimes in the peak of the intensity of the season when it's almost like triage everything needs attention at once yep. and you've got to get the orders out and mm -hmm. you know you've got a market starting you've got restaurants demanding orders you've got irrigation needs you know it's sometimes easy and i i will speak for myself to get lost in the immediacy and the demands of the of that process and forget uh, or or not have the time to do the outreach and community work and the education that for at least for me is so important yeah. you know and so i think that um if anything in terms of my own failures it would i would have to say there's there's two areas one if you have a family it is darn near impossible to give your family the kind of attention they deserve at the mm -hmm. peak of the season oh yeah and i think in that area it's been i have been so lucky that my children and my partners have been so incredibly supportive and patient mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and we've all somehow turned out well enough <laughs> <laughs> uh, in spite of it. Uh -huh. I think that looking back, I think that I would say my biggest failure is in finding balance. You know, it's mm -hmm. that, yeah. that in the process of being so fixated on getting the work done and doing it well, that sometimes you forget to take time for yourself, to take time for your family, to take time for your friends, and to take time to be out in the community that you're serving. And I think, you know, I have a, uh, Elliot Coleman and I formed an organization a few years ago called the Agrarian Elders, mm -hmm. and we meet every other year in California. And that's about 30 people who've been farming for 35 years or more that get together. And one of the common threads that I hear is, you know, first of all, most of those people's children are not going to be farmers. Yeah. And so um, that makes you question <laughs> what you're doing. You know? right. And two, I think everybody is feeling the desire to back off and to have uh, a succession plan, to have an exit yeah. plan, and to have some time to experience other aspects of life. And I think this, for me, is 
I don't know if I'd call it a failure, but it's certainly been a big challenge, you know. Well, it's, um, so, yeah. Yeah, it's the learning experiences. That's really what we're after. Yeah, I mean, look, I can go through, there's uh, like 10 million things that ag- agriculturally I have failed at, uh-huh. you know, of course. You know, I could just go on and on. That could be a, you know, a, a full day program. Yeah, you know? exactly. But I think in the end, you know, when you really look back on your life, what you what you find is most important to reflect on is, you know, you know, did you do right by your family? Did you do right yeah. by your community? Yeah. Did you do right by the people you're working with? You mm-hmm. know, and uh, and how you know, um, and while I do not, I would not use the word failure. I would say that reconfiguring how I the focus of my time and my priorities would have probably been beneficial. So that's a pretty honest answer. Yeah. You know? so, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So what do you consider your biggest success? Oh, well, then the same answers. That's so interesting, you know, because <laughs> I'd say actually the people, you know, like uh, a couple examples. A couple of years ago, at the farmer's market on Salt Spring Island, because I also run my family farm on right. the island, which is a 120-acre farm. Mm-hmm. A, a young guy who apprenticed with me uh, came to me. We just set up our stand. And we're getting ready for the big day, you know, the big market. He pulls me aside and he says, look up and down the aisles here at the market. I said, okay, yeah, what am I looking at? You know, help me out here. <laughs> He said, well, you know, do you realize that so many of the people that are selling here have been, have either apprenticed or studied with you or have been informed by what you've done? And I was like, oh, my God, you know, actually, yeah, they're my competition, (laughs) (laughs) which, you know, you can hope for, right? Right. Um, uh, And they are, they, you know, and so that was amazing. And then I had another experience, which Mm -hmm. was. I was with a close chef friend of mine in San Francisco, um, and we went to the Ferry Plaza market where I used to sell, Mm -hmm. and it was a Saturday. It's in San Francisco, and a wonderful market. And as we walked around, I got pulled aside by five or six individuals who, uh, younger farmers who are now farming, who had apprenticed with me, Uh and I had no idea they were there. And by the end of the market, I was loaded down with the foods, produced by the hands of people who had worked with me or, or apprenticed with me. And we went that evening, and this chef prepared a meal with those foods and served it to 30 of our friends. And it was a moment for me of uh, – a, it was such an amazing moment to feel that here I was eating the foods grown by the hands of people who um, who had in some small or possibly large way been yeah. informed by the work that I had done. And I just – because, you know, when you have your head down doing the work, you sometimes forget. Yeah, the ripple yeah. effect has been profound. So th- yeah. those are, I would say it's the people. And so I've kind of, I sound like I've contradicted myself, but no. not, I haven't. No. You know? yeah. 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 Wow. That was, that moved me. That was moving. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So I ask this question every time, and I am really excited to ask you to find out what drives you. Why do you do what you do? Truthfully, especially in the last year or two, I've been asking myself that question. You know, uh-huh. um, my father died about a year and a half ago, which was a profound mm-hmm. experience. And I turned sixty. I'm now sixty-two, so that mm-hmm. was a couple of years ago. Um, and both those things really made me realize that this thing is really short, precarious, uh-huh. fragile. Yeah, there's an and end. And I began to, yeah, and I began to look at um, my life and my work, and I began to ask myself, what, what is really important now? What do I want to do in the next, you know, 20 vital years that I have or longer, you know? Yeah. And I realized that, you know, I am extremely motivated and driven by the same things that, that I got into this for. Mm -hmm. I feel still to this day, after 40 some years of doing this, you know, every time I plant a seed and I see it emerge, I'm still in awe of the miracle. Of that, <laughs> Isn't that you know? amazing? And and so on the very physical level, I suspect, even though I threaten every year that I'm you know I'm gonna you know go off and be a waiter or something or a mechanic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. I still am in awe of that miracle and want to participate in the, in the process of that miracle. You know, and I don't want to ever let that go. So there's that. That piece will continue, and so that's that's for me. That's my personal enjoyment. But yeah. then 
I have this whole other need, and that is, you know, what am I doing with the skills I have been given, the mm-hmm. gifts I've been offered, the privilege that I have been afforded to reach out to those who are less privileged, who do not have the ability to walk out their door and harvest a meal mm-hmm. or have quiet or have darkness at night or be uh, able to work with living soil and mm-hmm. do all the great things that we get to do as, as farmers. What's my responsibility to the rest of the world? And so I, you know, I feel that that will drive, that drives me, uh, that's mm-hmm. driven me to start the projects I have in California and elsewhere, and it's driven me to start Soul Food Street Farms in Vancouver. It's why I continue to write books, because mm-hmm. I feel like I can do the work, but I want the world to be inspired by that work to yeah. some degree, to hear our stories and to be informed by what we've learned, you know. Yeah. And so, you know, there's an interesting thing about farming. There is in farming a constant and never-ending feedback loop. <laughs> there is the feedback loop that comes from mm-hmm. your every action that you do creates an interaction in the biological system and a reaction. Uh, so there's that feedback loop, seeing how what you've done today affects what happens tomorrow or the next day or, or a month or six months later, you mm-hmm. know and being present for that and responding to that, you know. But there's also the the social feedback loop. Yeah. It's being at the market and have one, having someone come and tell you how amazing it was to have eaten the melon that they bought from you the week <laughs> before or or asking you how to prepare the flagellate beans or or having the revelation to discover that fresh lima beans are um the most one of the most amazing things in the world, yeah. even though the people have a bad attitude about that. Exactly. And so, so there's the social feedback loop, and then you know, I think that, yeah, I mean, I think we are, as humans, we depend on that, and the work is too hard in, and too physical in agriculture not to have some of that going on. Yeah. And so I don't know where I was going with all that, but somewhere. Yeah, no, no, <laughs> so I was... lost it. <laughs> No, that, that was beautiful. It was uh, uh, really the answer to the question of what drives you, why you do what you do. Yeah. So, yeah. So I'm all about education. I have to know, is there one book that has really been influential for you in this process over the past 40 years? Well, I mean, you know, um, I gave a talk, a keynote talk at the Common Ground Fair uh, a few weeks ago in Maine, and I, it was fascinating. I mean, this is a quite an amazing event. I'd never been there. But the, at the end of the thing, there was a question period, and a guy comes up very close to the podium, and he raises his hand. He says, so who's the who's the father of your organic movement? I was like, well, you tell me, because I wanted his answer. Right? Yeah. Of course. We all know Sir Albert Howard is, is considered that, you uh-huh. know, um, certainly uh, soil and health and, yeah. and, and all of the the writings that Sir Albert Howard did were uh, profound influences on all of us in many ways that we know we we either don't recognize or we know. Of course, as I I followed the, his answer by saying, but remember, Sir Albert Howard was influenced and inspired and formed by what he was seeing in India by traditional cultures right. you know, that had been doing this for thousands of years. Let's not forget this was not his idea. You yeah. Know? He articulated it, right? Yeah. I would also say, you know, I've been very fortunate to have uh, gotten to know uh, Wendell and Tanya Berry. And and certainly uh, any of us would be hard-pressed to not acknowledge Wendell's influence on all of our thinking. Oh, yeah. And certainly I would have to say, you know, the unsettling of America, mm-hmm. culture and agriculture, uh, a kind of a watershed piece of work that really um, uh, has had a profound influence on us. Uh, Rachel Carson, I know you asked for one. I'm, I apologize. No, that's all right. It's all good. <laughs> Rachel Carson, you know, Silent Spring, what a oh, what yes. a courageous, incredibly courageous piece of work. Oh, yeah, I could true. go on. I, You know, I think that this is, of course, knowing the infl- influence that those individual writers have had on my life uh-huh. to some degree drives me as a writer to... To want to contribute something lasting as well to yeah. the to this incredible body of knowledge that's been recorded, and so yeah, I think those are probably have right, had yes. important influence. Yeah. Yeah. So, what one final piece of advice do you have for our listeners? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think that 
you know, we like to think that we have a food crisis. You know, I hear it all the time. Mm-hmm. People pinpoint various things, you know. I could I don't want to list the litany of, you know, the ain't it awful litany of all that's wrong. Right. I like to think that what we really have is a crisis of participation more than a food crisis. Yeah. And so I think that what's wonderful about the urban agriculture movement, what's wonderful about the new agrarian movement, is that it is engaging more people to take some responsibility for how their food comes to them, Mm -hmm. to engage and to support and to respect and to honor those who are growing that food, and to uh, find even some small way to be a participant, not just an observer or a reader or a, like a baby bird in a nest waiting to be fed from some distant farm to, to actually get involved, you know. Mm-hmm. And so my advice for eaters is to, to really find some way to insert yourself into the process, even if it's, you know, growing a little bit for yourself, salad greens or mm-hmm. something simple. To, to engage and get to know personally the people who you are supporting, who are growing your food, whether it's at a farmer's market or elsewhere. You know. yeah. For farmers, I would say that first and foremost, it is really important if you're considering getting into this profession, go and study with somebody who's mm-hmm. really respected and who's doing a great yeah. job. You will save yourself. Learn from their mistakes. Yeah. And the other thing that happens when you do that, go work with them. For a year or two, you discover whether this is really what you want to do or not, because oh, yeah. too often a lot of people find out, wait a minute, this is really hard. I don't <laughs> want to do this. You know? Oh, yeah. Of course, you know, I can be as as shameless as possible because, you know, it's the it's the beginnings of a launch of the book. But I do I would encourage people to read this book because Absolutely. I think it's a. It's inspirational. It's, it's, you know, it's called Street Farm, Growing Food, Jobs, and Hope on the Urban Frontier. It's got some nuts and bolts, and it has some wonderful sidebars that tell the stories of particular foods. And it's mm-hmm. inspirational from the perspective of here's what's possible with the hands. And there's a wonderful quote. Sometimes it's the people that no one imagines anything of who do the things that no one can imagine. That's, that's from the imitation game, and that's in the opening quote of the book. And it's it's really emblematic, not just for the book, but for all of us. You know, yeah. we we need to step beyond what we think is imagined of us and do things that are unimaginable. And I think uh, certainly mm. that's been the story of my life. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you so much for joining us on the show today and sharing your experience with us, Michael. It's been a treat getting to chat with you. I'm really honored that you included me. Thank you so much. I've I've enjoyed our conversation. Absolutely. Again, the name of the book is Street Farm, Growing Food, Jobs, and Hope on the Urban Frontier, and it is by Chelsea Green Publishing, written by Michael Abelman. Again, thank you so much, Michael. And how can our listeners get a hold of you? Where can they find out more information? Well, there's a couple ways they can get a hold of me. They can certainly find out more about the Soul Food, Mm S-O-L-E-FoodFarms.com. They can go to the Chelsea Green website. It has some wonderful uh, interviews with me. It has my manifesto on their site, chelseagreen.com. Mm-hmm. There's also a site, michaelableman.com, which I believe was just uh, put together. I have actually not seen it up <laughs> live yet. So, so nice. So yeah, and uh, you know, I I'm happy to. Um, I also can be reached by email. I have no trouble sharing that. If yeah. um, people are patient, this is a especially busy time for me. But oh, yes. um, M the letter M as in Michael dot Abelman, A B L E M A N at fields of plenty dot com. M dot Abelman at fields of plenty dot com. So Perfect. yeah, I'd love to hear from your listeners. Perfect. Well that's it for today. Thanks for joining us on the Urban Farm Podcast. Decades ago, I started growing food in my front and backyard, and I realized that my mission in life is to inspire and empower others to grow their own nutrient dense, healthy organic food. Because of this, a lot of people have come to me with their gardening questions over the years. And that got me thinking, what if we put together a community that would help budding gardeners blossom? So I finally made the idea a reality with my Urban Farm U member program. Each month, your membership includes three live online events, a monthly class, a chit chat with an expert, and a monthly coaching session plus access to the experts on our member page and a significant discount on our signature courses. I'm deeply committed to transforming our global food system, and I do this by empowering you to grow your own food. 
The Urban Farm Membership Program is a simple way to get going. Please join me in transforming your food system today. To learn more, go to urbanfarmmembership.org or text MEMBERSHIP to 33444. That's urbanfarmmembership.org or text MEMBERSHIP to 33444. We hope you enjoyed today's episode of the Urban Farm Podcast. Remember to listen three days a week for tips, advice, and resources to help you on your journey with urban farming. You can find us on the web at urbanfarm.org or send us an email to podcast at urbanfarm.org. In the words of Vincent Van Gogh, great things are done by a series of small things brought together. Be encouraged that with each lesson learned and skill developed, you are one step closer in the direction of your dreams.